Hi, Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Week in Review, seven stories from the American Revolution where I will be discussing the last seven founders of the day from this past week. I'm about five minutes late. I do apologize for that. I tried to sneak in our music at the park beforehand, but now we're here. Uh, again, apologies. We have a lot of really, really fun people to discuss today. So let's get right into it. Uh, let me know if you're here, if you have any questions. This is the time to ask questions. So uh, let's get down to brass tacks. Hi, John Adams. Thank you for coming. We are going to start with not a founder, kind of a founder, an anti-federalist. We are up to federal farmer number six. Ashley, thank you for coming. Uh, federal farmer is about pretend federalists. Now, I will remind you that the first five federal farmer papers were published early uh, in in October of 1787, just less than a month after the Constitution had been first published, not even ratified or passed or anything, just published to have people read. Uh, many anti-federalists jumped on it right away, including Federal Farmer, who again is probably Melanchthon Smith. Long time it was thought to be Richard Henry Lee, but it was probably Melanchthon Smith. Uh, Richard, um, the farmer comes out, uh, he published the first five observations, as they're generally called for the Federal Farmer, and then stopped. But they were really lucrative, so the publisher basically convinces him to write some more, which he does. He writes a whole bunch more, uh, coming out starting at the end of December 1787, mostly in July of 1788. That being said, this one is about pretend Federalists. Uh, he does have a lengthy amount of recap of his previous papers. Then he talks about pretend Federalists. Now, we want to talk about the word Federalism for a second. Uh, federalism is different from confederalism, or a federation is different than a confederation. Uh, the Articles of Confederation were separate governments entirely and essentially acted as a peace treaty, which included a little bit of friendly trade, uh, almost like, like the United Nations, kind of. Uh, and then a federated government is one government, but the subject states or provinces have a whole lot of sway. Then there's a national government. And a national government is when you just have one government and it's in charge. And many, one of the reasons actually, and they, and the federal farmer discusses this in this paper, uh, the federalists started calling themselves federalists as a propaganda method and calling the anti-federalist anti-federalist as a propaganda method. Technically, or at least what the anti-federalist argued is, no, we're the federalists. We're the ones who want a federation of states that have a lot of power with one government up top and only a little power. And what it sounds like the federalists want, again, they're, what they were saying is the federalists, as they call themselves, seem to want a national government. Now it can be argued and debated uh, whether that's true or not. <laughs> um, that being said, uh, he called two people pretend federalists. He said the federalists... Uh, many of the loudest speakers in favor of the Constitution were pretend Federalists. They weren't Federalists, they were Nationalists. And then on the other side, he talks about people on the other side, like Shazites. Uh, many people called themselves Federalists, who also kind of fell under the Anti-Federalist banner, uh, but they actually were for anarchy. So a lot of people calling themselves Federalists according to the federal farmer, were absolutely not actually Federalists. He also says how most people in the middle uh, disagreed with the loudest bullhorns on either side. On both sides of the argument, there are some people with really loud bullhorns, not, uh, you know, figuratively, uh, talking about either how great or how terrible the Constitution is. Truthfully, and it's interesting because the farmer admits this, there's a lot of good things, he says, in the Constitution. There are some things that need to be changed. And it's from this point that the federal farmer, because uh, I'll remind you, this is published Christmas Day, 1787. So at this point, three states have already ratified the Constitution. And he seems to be turning his argument from, we shouldn't probably accept this government to, we should make sure there are amendments to this government. There are things that are left out. Now that the people have been able to look, it's not just a room full of 50-something people. Uh, now that everyone's taken a look, there are some obvious errors that need to be corrected. He then goes on to talk about uh, rights. He talks about the natural rights, which are outlined in the, the Declaration of Independence, which I'll remind you is not law. The Declaration of Independence has nothing to do with law. It was just talking about government and rights. 
Uh, and the Declaration issues natural rights that are um, inherent according to that document and according to most political theory at the time. Uh, but he also says there are constitutional rights that aren't natural, that you don't just have, that you need to be granted by your government or else the government takes them from you. Uh, and uh, these are things like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, the right to a fair trial, all the things that end up later in the Bill of Rights, thanks, thanks in large part to the federal farmer and all the other uh, um, uh, anti-federalists at the time. And then he concludes, and this is awesome. Uh, I actually, I recommend you guys read it. I don't have a link in this description, but in this description, I have a link to the article on the federal farmer. And at the bottom of that, I have a link to the actual paper. He spends like four paragraphs speaking about uh, the states themselves at the time. And it's really fascinating because he's comparing each individual state to the other states. He says, like, uh, most states have one-year terms for governor, except for New York has three, and, uh, Vir and Virginia has three, right? Uh, and, like, little details like that, but it's really fascinating because he goes through, uh, man, you know what, in hindsight, I should have pulled it up in front of me. I wonder if I have it, actually. Let me, let me just, if it's already up, I will grab it. No, it's too long. It'll take too much time. But highly recommend you guys check it out. Um, oh, no, John Adams, jaywalking. Uh, but, but yeah, that's how he concludes with, like, this long list of, like, comparisons. It's very interesting if you like to learn about the American Revolution because he's very openly t giving you a contemporary account of how the states were different in their operation. Anyway, that's the federal farmer. Let's bounce over and start some fun stories. We're going to start with you, Mercer. Now, if you guys like the American Rev, if you uh, enjoy the theatrical piece Hamilton in any nature, you might recognize the name Mercer because at one point, I believe in the second act, um, Madison goes to Hamilton uh, no, 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 uh, Hamilton and Berg, one of them is like, uh, hey, did you hear their name Mercer Street? Is oh, all he had to do was die. The Mercer legacy is secure. Sure. Now, it was Berg, thank you. Um, yes, Mercer Street. It's named after you, Mercer. Uh, he actually had died significantly longer before the second act of that play takes, uh, takes place, but whatever. <laughs> um, Let's talk about Hugh Mercer. Hugh Mercer was born in Scotland, and he started rebelling early. He actually flees Scotland after he was part of an unsuccessful attempt to dethrone the King of England um, in what's known as the Jacobin Uprising. Uh, long, short story long. Uh, the Jacobin Uprising was essentially a religious sect. Um, I'm not a religious scholar. I believe it was kind of a, a Catholic sect. Um, within England who wanted to overthrow, um, they wanted to overthrow the king and it didn't work. So he runs away and he goes to Pennsylvania. And yes, as Mr. Adams is saying, he becomes a doctor, a physician, as they called it at the time in Pennsylvania. Now, apparently the king wasn't too mad at him because when the French and Indian war breaks out, he actually joins the French and Indian war. Um, he becomes very friendly with many Virginians, including George Washington at the time. And he's out in the West where Washington was fighting uh, around where we would now consider Pittsburgh. And he's injured in the fighting and he leaves the field. And he actually travels alone, uh, wounded, across Pennsylvania for two weeks to get back to civilization where he heals his wounds. And then... Everyone's very impressed by his efforts, so therefore, they give him a promotion. And they're like, you, you, <laughs> whoops, uh, you, you are now uh, in charge of Pittsburgh. It was then called Fort Pitt, but it's what we now call Pittsburgh. And some of the earliest buildings built in what we now call Pittsburgh uh, were actually, oh, the construction was overseen by Mercer. So now he's also an architect, kind of. After the war, he actually buys land and moves to Virginia. And he buys land directly from George Washington, his new friend. Uh, he moves to Fredericksburg, Virginia, where Washington had some family. Uh, and he not only opens a medical practice, but a, an apothecary as well. And he starts treating some of the wealthy elite. So he is really hobnobbing with the right circles. When the Revolutionary War begins, uh, he joins the Committee of Safety, which oversaw the militias and taking the militias from British control to Patriot control. 
Uh, he actually participated in the Virginia militia for a while, but then he was given an appointment by the Continental Army as a brigadier general. So he is, he becomes a really high-ranking brigadier general, and he's put in charge of something called the Flying Camp Battalion. Now, a battalion is a big group of soldiers. A flying camp is the important part. It acts kind of like the Minutemen acted uh, in Boston, in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, other places, where if something happens, like, real quick, and you need someone to get there, you call the flying camp. They are designed to move quickly. Moving an entire army can be cumbersome and time-consuming, but moving a flying camp is supposed to be very quick. So if Washington suddenly found out, oh no, the British are going to this town in New Jersey, you Mercer, go get them. And that was his job, was to fly, the flying camp. He was to fly and make haste, as they say. Um, and he does this spectacularly. He participates in a whole slew of battles in the uh, early days of the war. I'm not, unfortunately, uh, my, my, my particular, I'm not the best in military history. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, but what I do know is he participates in some of the battles in New York, and then he joins Washington crossing the Delaware. And crossing the Delaware is one of the last things he'll ever do. Um, they go to, um, they take Trenton, and then they're moving down to Princeton. Uh, uh, yeah, they take Trenton, uh, and then the next day they're going to Princeton. Mercer and his flying camp are separated from the rest of the army, and they are ambushed. During this ambush, he is wounded. Uh, he is, uh, they, his horse gets shot out from under him. He's hurt. They, sur the British surround him. Uh, he does not surrender, which was kind of dumb because they bayoneted him a bunch of times and beat him up really hardcore. Uh, and they bayoneted him, and then some of his men come and chase the British off him. They prop him up against the tree, and he keeps giving orders from the tree. Uh, and that tree became the Mercer Oak. And that tree actually stood for like 200 years. It fell down in a storm like 10 years ago or something. But the Mercer Oak was around for a very long time. Uh, he actually suffers for about nine days in excruciating, agonizing pain. Until finally, he tastes the sweet relief of death. And shortly thereafter... They name a street in New York after him. And um, he has, I'm sure, at least one county named after him. Uh, several towns. Uh, all sorts of all sorts of streets. Not just the one in the play Hamilton. He has a lot of streets named after him. Uh, Mr. Adams. Yes, James Monroe absolutely was part of the crossing of the Delaware. He's actually one of the few people... Mon future President Monroe is like 18 years old when they crossed the Delaware. And at, uh, I think it was at Trenton, he is working with his commander... William Washington, a nephew of George Washington, one of the only other Washingtons to serve in the war, uh, and they are running down a cannon, and they are both severely wounded by cannon shot. Like, uh, uh, Monroe's really lucky he doesn't die when he's 19. Uh, and then he goes on to, decades later, do all sorts of extremely important things. One of the most underrated American founders is James Monroe, without a doubt. Uh, he, 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 he beat the, the first Senate race for Virginia, James Monroe beats James Madison, who just wrote the Constitution. Uh, he buys Louisiana with Robert R. Livingston at the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, James Monroe ends up being a, a, an, an integral part of the Madison administration during the War of 1812. Uh, he becomes president, and he's president during the Era of Good Feelings, at which point, his second time James Madison ran for his second term as president, he ran unopposed. Now, we talk a lot about George Washington winning unanimously the first time. James Monroe ran for President of the United States unopposed. I'm not, we're not talking about Madison today, but I want to let that sink in. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, James Monroe, yes, I believe you, you're right. He was one of the guys who found out Maria Reynolds. Well done, Mr. Adams, because the play Hamilton does get that wrong. Uh, it's not Jefferson and Burr Madison. It is Monroe, and I want to say Rufus King. I might be wrong about that. Uh, I think it was Rufus King, and then another guy. It's funny, I was thinking about actually um, uh, doing uh, a video just specifically on that. Uh, and no, uh, William Washington did not die in the battle. He has since died. This is 200 years ago. They have all died. But no, he did not die in the battle. They both survived. Um, let's move along. We got a lot of fun stories today. I'm going to take another sip of water. Sorry, I got a little tickle in my throat. This might be a long episode, because we're about to talk about James Wilkinson. we got a few people with a lot to talk about. 
Uh, and stick around, John Adams. We're going to talk about another person from the play uh, very shortly. James Wilkinson is the great evil of the American Revolution. Now, I know that's a bold thing to say. There are a lot of great evils, They're like, you know, slavery. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, when I look at history, I try and be as objective as possible. I do my best not to take sides. But there are some characters that are really hard to be fond of. James Wilkinson is the most difficult person to find a uh, happy thumbs up about from the American Revolution. James Wilkinson is from Maryland. He's like... 19 years old, his family's kind of wealthy, so when the Revolutionary War breaks out, he is quickly appointed to, uh, he is, as a, an officer in the Continental Army. He becomes an aide-de-camp, an assistant. First to Nathaniel Green, though this is early before Green has, does really, really well in the war, when he's doing kind of poorly, uh, then he becomes an aide-de-camp to Benedict Arnold, actually, um, before going over to Horatio Gates. And he is with Horatio Gates during the Saratoga campaign. During the Saratoga campaign, he, uh, you know, serves pretty valiantly. Uh, famously, Benedict Arnold was the hero of Saratoga. But Horatio Gates is the one who responds to Congress. And he chooses his aide-de-camp, James Wilkinson, to go tell Congress the good news that we just won at Saratoga. Let's go get the French to join this war. James Wilkinson goes and then stops and just kind of hangs out and uh, meets some family. He starts courting a Biddle woman. We love the Biddles on this channel. Uh, and then he finally goes to the Congress and says, hey, we did it. And he hands him a letter from Horatio Gates. And the letter basically says Horatio Gates is the hero of Saratoga. Now, we know now Horatio Gates had told Benedict Arnold not to join the fight. And Benedict Arnold helped win. He casts Gates aside and wins the fight. Um, James Wilkinson gives all the credit to Horatio Gates. Almost all the credit. He gives himself a whole lot of credit, too. And the fact that he was the one Gates chose to deliver the letter told Congress, this is supposed to be a really good guy. Let's give him a promotion. And he's given a promotion, a brevet promotion, to Brigadier General. Now, he doesn't actually hold the command. It's an honorary title for the time. But... This makes a lot of people upset, <laughs> like a lot of people in the Continental Army, because James Wilkinson is not easy to get along with. Uh, he's obviously very selfish and self-promoting, and he uh, now has just kind of gotten this promotion for seemingly no reason. Also, everyone who is at the battle knows that it was Arnold is the guy who should be getting all the thumbs up at the time. That being said, uh, he everyone's upset at him, and then... He becomes part of the Conway Cabal. He's actually appointed to the Board of War, along with Horatio Gates, to oversee George Washington. Uh, and that doesn't go well, because he's part of the Conway Cabal. He's actually the one who spoils the whole cabal, because he writes a letter to a bunch of people. He writes the letters trying to say, hey, let's replace Washington. One of them goes to... Uh, uh, I believe it was Lord Sterling, William Alexander, and William Alexander is a great friend of George Washington by this point, and literally goes right into Washington's tent and says, did you see this? Did you see? Uh, and Washington responds kind of hostily uh, to the Continental Congress, to everyone, and suddenly they realize it's only about three or four people actually in this cabal, and it's quashed almost right away. Because of this whole endeavor, James Wilkinson is forced to resign from the Continental Army. So he goes to Kentucky and takes up a life there. He ends up joining the militia there, becoming an early settler of Kentucky, a more notable uh, settler of Kentucky. He was a high ranking, a fairly high ranking officer in the Continental Army, so it's not like everyone lost all their respect for him. In fact, people still very much respected his efforts on the field, and he would prove if there's one thing he's good at, it's being a snake. And if there's something else he's good at, it's uh, being on the battlefield. We'll get to why he's a snake. Let's get to it now, in fact. So, Wilkinson goes, oh, I, he actually helps push for Kentucky to become a state. Now, at this time, you have to remember, under the Articles of Confederation, all the different states saw themselves as different nations. They were separate colonies, They were, I'm sorry, separate countries that just happened to have this confederation as a firm league of friendship. It literally says at the beginning of the Articles of Confederation, it's a firm league of friendship. The states retain their sovereignty. So... Uh, Slippery Jim over here goes over to uh, try and get Kentucky recognized as a state under the Articles. And they're not ready for that. 
they are, at this point, starting to consider the United States Constitution, and we just can't bring in another state right now. Let's get this Constitution stuff out of the way. So James goes down to Louisiana, still at this point held by Spain, and talks to the Spanish. and says, hey, why don't you grant... We're going to make Kentucky a state whether they like it or not. So why don't you grant Kentucky rights to the Mississippi? At the time, Spain owned the rights to trade on the Mississippi, and they charged Americans an extremely high tax. This would lead to the Whiskey Rebellion, not uh, far down the line, by the way. And he says, why don't you... Why don't you let the people of Kentucky trade at a lower value and we'll give you a special status as, you know, Spain, a number one. Spain says no, but they do ask James Wilkinson if he'd like to be a spy. I think the appropriate term is double agent. Would you like for us to pay you for information on the Americans? And James Wilkinson says, yeah. And Wilkinson is given a code name. Agent 13. This man was Agent 13 working for the Spanish in Kentucky and other parts of America for the next 20 years. What's really fascinating about that is the title under his name below me. Senior Officer of the United States Army. You see, at the same time as they're writing the Constitution and starting George Washington's presidency, the Northwest Indian War breaks out. The Northwest Indian War is in what well, was then the Northwest Territory. Um, Ohio, Indiana, and, uh, Illinois, parts of Michigan, Wisconsin. There's a war going on. A lot of the Native American group, not a lot, uh, several Native American groups who had been pushed out of their land uh, after the American Revolution formed a confederacy of their own, and they were fighting to protect this territory for themselves. Now, it did not be going great. <laughs> um, first, George Washington sends up um, a whole bunch of people, including Arthur Sinclair. James Wilkinson joins it at this time, and he is part of St. Clair's defeat, one of the worst defeats in American history against the worst defeat against uh, Native Americans in American uh, U.S. Army history. There wasn't a U.S. Army yet. Wasn't quite yet. Washington, because of St. Clair's defeat, forms the Legion of the United States, and that is the birth of the modern United States Army. I'll remind you, the Continental Army had dis dissolved after the war ended. Here we are, almost 10 years later, and we form the Legion of the United States. Uh, and Wilkinson wants to get appointed as the commanding officer. Now, Washington considers him. President Washington considers Wilkinson to take over. Again, Everyone knows he's been talking to Spain, and they don't really trust him, but he, no, you know, no one thinks he's a spy. They just think he's, he hangs out with the wrong crowd. Furthermore, they have seen him in action, and they know he can win battles on the field. Now, they don't choose Wilkinson. Instead, they choose Anthony Wayne, mad Anthony Wayne, and he assembles the Legion in the United States. Uh, mad Anthony keeps, uh, keeps on trucking. And uh, James Wilkinson becomes really bitter about this. Really bitter for being appointed. By the way, Wilkinson was appointed a number two in the United States Army. Second highest ranking officer, I guess technically third if you count Washington, who was commander-in-chief, in all of the United States Army. And he's real upset he's only number two. Right? <laughs> now, this leads to a rivalry between Wayne and Wilkinson. At first, Wayne's like, whatever, it's fine. But then Wayne invites Wilkinson to his Christmas party. And Wilkinson, again, they're on the frontier fighting in a war. And Wilkinson turns him down, says, no, I've got better things to do than to go to your Christmas party, Anthony Wayne. And Anthony Wayne says, well, forget that. And he says, now we're enemies. This is a slap in my face. What have you been doing in Spain? And Anthony Wayne investigates what's going on in Spain, and he finds something, and he brings, he sets a date for a court-martial for James Wilkinson then. And then, Anthony Wayne dies. Very suddenly. And things are thrown into a little bit of disarray, and uh, when the number one guy dies, the number two guy takes over. And this is when, in, the, in, I believe, 1795 or 96, this is when James Wilkinson, Agent 13, spying for the British, becomes the senior officer of the United States Army. Means after President Washington, James Wilkinson is the commander of the Army. 
and spying for Spain. Now, by this time, he wasn't giving Spain a lot of information they didn't know, so the funds had dried up a little bit, but once he becomes senior officer in the United States Army, now he's very valuable to the Spanish crown. Uh, I will note that this does happen after the Anthony Wayne wins the Northwest Indian War, so that war has concluded. But now Wayne is a really important guy, uh, and he continues in this, uh, he's in this position for a few years, but then uh, the quasi-war with France breaks out. Adam, John Adams, sorry Mr. Adams, makes that little mistake of having uh, George Washington take back over as uh, senior officer of the army with Hamilton at number two. So Wilkinson drops to number three for a few years, though when you're talking about Hamilton and Washington, it's not like Anthony Wayne. He couldn't really complain about that. Um, but they leave those positions, and once Thomas Jefferson comes back into office, James Wilkinson is then once again appointed senior officer of the United States Army. He would be there for more than a dozen years in this position. He also is chosen by Thomas Jefferson as the first, once the Louisiana Purchase is made, he is the first governor of the Louisiana Territory. He marches into New Orleans with the new, uh, um, um, not governor, the new, uh, 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 I guess mayor, I forget his name, his title, but William Claremont is now in charge of the city of New Orleans. But Wilkinson is in charge of all this territory. He's the one who marches into New Orleans and takes it over for the United States. The Spanish keep him on the payroll at this point. But interestingly enough, there's another gentleman named Aaron Burr who comes along. You see, Aaron Burr, he had shot Alexander Hamilton. You definitely heard of that. Uh, but he was not accused of treason for that. That was a gentlemanly thing. We're going to keep out of this, says the government. What he does next, because he now is not vice president anymore, and he loses his race for governor, he needs something to do. So he ends up going, Aaron Burr ends up going south. He wants to go to Mexico. Now, Burr claims that he was going there uh, to lease land from the Spanish government in Texas, which is not part of Louisiana territory. I'm just going to lease some land from the Spanish uh, I am going to get people to settle there. It's going to be fun. He includes James Will. Apparently, he brings James Wilkinson in on this. Says, Wilkinson, you want to get in on this? Now, what Wilkinson says, and many other people said, was that Aaron Burr wasn't just going to settle there. He was going to invade Texas. It was called filibustering. And he was trying to raise an army to invade Texas and set up an independent nation in Texas. Now, the truth of the matter, we'll probably never know for sure. There was a lot of lying going on at the time. It certainly doesn't seem like uh, he was. And in fact, somewhere behind me is uh, uh, the Nancy Eisenberg book about Aaron. Uh, uh, it's called Fallen Founder. It's about Aaron Burr. If you're interested in Aaron Burr, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, she concludes that he probably wasn't doing too much wrong. He certainly made mistakes along the way. That's obvious. But... He, he probably was not trying to start another nation to declare war on the United States. It just seems very out of character for Aaron Burr. Anyway, that's what James Wilkinson writes in a letter to Thomas Jefferson. Because Jefferson's now president. Wilkinson says, hey, guess what? Your buddy Burr, he's going to start a new nation to start a war on you. So, Aaron Burr is arrested for treason. <laughs> James Wilkinson arrests him. James Wilkinson then goes over to Virginia with Burr for the trial. And Jefferson has a star witness against Aaron Burr, who now he's very angry at for reasons you probably well know we're not going to get into now. The star witness against Burr is James Wilkinson. And James Wilkinson gets to the stand. He has evidence. It's a letter. But it's really heavily doctored because Wilkinson edited out all the parts that would make him look bad. Because it certainly seems like, if anything... James Wilkinson may very well have been trying to entrap Burr. Again, we don't know for sure. Everything's been edited down very heavily. And Wilkinson gets on the stand and the judges are like, did you edit? Did you edit this? And they're like, he's like, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, you can't do that. And plus, he's kind of an asshole. So everyone's looking at him and can't deal with him. And this star witness actually ruins the case and embarrasses the Jefferson administration. This is the first treason trial of a high-ranking figure. Again, this is a former vice president on trial for treason less than 20 years after the Constitution was written. This is an amazingly important event 
uh, that's often overlooked because Aaron Burr is usually thought of for uh, attacking Hamilton. Now, Burr gets off of the trial. He does not, he is not, he's acquitted of treason, much because Wilkinson looks like an idiot. And again, he was working for the Spanish at this time, so he may have been paid to um, try and ruffle some feathers within the government. Excuse me, take a quick sip. Now, despite all this, Wilkinson spends another six years as senior officer of the United States Army. It isn't until the War of 1812 breaks out when Secretary of well, soon to be Secretary of War Henry Dearborn is promoted to Major General. And a few people are promoted to Major General over him who have served in previous wars. And he's also lost some confidence. That being said, he's then sent to New York where James Wilkinson performs admirably in New York, winning several battles because he's really good at warring. After this, he finally resigns after a lifetime of service in the army. Uh, and he is sent to Mexico as an envoy to Mexico, not a minister, not an ambassador, not a consul, an envoy. You see, Mexico had been looking at the United States and saying, wait a minute, we can just throw off our, our, col our colonizers? Well, why don't we do that? And the Mexican Revolution breaks out. And Wilkinson is sent there in the middle of the Mexican Revolution to play, to basically say to whoever wins that, okay, what do you want your relationship to be with the United States? Uh, he's there from... Uh, James Madison sends him, sends him there. He's there the entire Monroe administration, and he continues there uh, into the Adams administration when he passes away. And Wilkinson actually died in Mexico and is buried in Mexico City. Seemingly fitting ending to him, uh, having worked for the Spanish for so long, dying in a colony that had just thrown off Spain. Um, so that is James Wilkinson. Again, a lot to say about James Wilkinson. I'm sure I just skipped over a ton because he is unbelievably fascinating. Excuse me, take a little sip there. Um, move on. Who's after James Wilkinson? We have Hercules Mulligan. Excuse me. Hercules Mulligan. Oh boy, there is a lot to say about Hercules Mulligan because, again, the play Hamilton has made some things fairly unclear. They don't really get a lot wrong about Mulligan, but they make things unclear about him. You see, Mulligan wasn't a friend of Hamilton's. He was a mentor to Alexander Hamilton. By the time the Revolutionary War breaks out, Hercules Mulligan is already really upset at most of the taxes. He was a tailor, as many people know. Taylor for the rich and famous of the time. Um, the taxes that came about in the decade previous to the American Revolution, one of the things that was hurt by these taxes very heavily was fabric. Being a tailor, fabric was very important to his business. Uh, additionally, working with the fabric, he, he did make some of his own fabric, but it still didn't help that much. Now, in, 17, uh, uh, um, in the mid-1770s, Hercules Mulligan is asked to take in a student. Uh, his brother, Yu, says, Hey, you know the Krugers down in the Caribbean? And Hercules Mulligan is like, Yeah, I know the Krugers. You know, we're from the same merchant. Mulligans were a merchant family, so were the Krugers. Yeah, I know the Krugers. What about them? They're sending a young man up here. He needs your help. And that young man was Alexander Hamilton. Uh, when Hamilton arrives, he's in his late teens, and Hercules Mulligan is in his mid-30s with a family. So don't let the play fool you that they were just bros hanging out. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, as I said, Mulligan ends up being a mentor to Hamilton. He takes Hamilton in. He brings Hamilton. Uh, he helps enroll Hamilton at Princeton. What they do get right in the play is that Hamilton tried to get an accelerated class at Princeton, and John Witherspoon was like, no, man, <laughs> like you take the same classes as everyone else. You're a poor kid from the Caribbean. Like the least you could do is do whatever all these rich kids who actually went to like Latin and grammar schools are doing. <laughs> uh, and Mul Hamilton doesn't like that. So he returns to New York and he goes to Mulligan's alma mater, uh, uh, King's College, which is now uh, Columbia. And while he does this, he actually stays in her in Hamilton's house which is nice. Uh, uh, let me reverse that. Uh, Hamilton stays in Hercules Mulligan's house 
while he's attending college. Now, once the Revolutionary War really starts getting hot, Hamilton starts, uh, he joins the, they call themselves the Corsicans, but uh, they're better known as the Hearts of Oak. And Hercules Mulligan, despite being o older, joins this group of college kids on the campus of King's College, which is essentially a militia that's training themselves, uh, called the Hearts of Oak. And he joins the, uh, the, the stealing of cannons at the Battery. I, I, I forgot to mention, too, before Hamilton even comes to North America, uh, Hercules Mulligan is already, he's already participated in the Battle of Golden Hill, which was violence that broke out in 1773 in New York. So he's kind of already a real rebel. But then the British come take New York, and for whatever reason that I just cannot figure out, Hercules Mulligan stays in New York and keeps his tailor shop, and the British are fine with it. Uh, despite him having actively been violent against the British on several occasions and having been an active member uh, uh, of the rebels. I can only assume he was the best tailor in the city and they were like, all right, we'll look the other way because of that. So what happens is Hercules Mulligan becomes a tailor, remains a tailor, but now it's for the British. All the officers, all the most important people in the British Navy, British Army are coming to him for their tailoring needs. It's about this time that George Washington uh, brings Alexander Hamilton on board as one of his aides de camp. And during this time, Washington realizes he needs better spy and better intelligence. And Mulligan, uh, Hamilton says, hey, the guy I used to live with, Hercules Mulligan, he's pretending to be a loyalist right now, but he's definitely a patriot. We should contact him. And they do. And Hercules Mulligan begins sending information to George Washington and the Continental Army. Because... While he's tailoring these men, as you may have seen in the show Turn, he's tailoring these men, and they're just talking about their battle plans. No biggie. <laughs> just talking about it. So, uh, he sends it back to the, uh, the Patriots, and on at least one occasion, actually stopped an assassination attempt on George Washington's life. Now, eventually, Benedict Arnold does some treason. And Benedict Arnold goes over to the British and he says, now I'm British, I'm going to tell you who their spies are. This guy, Hercules Mulligan, who's doing all your tailoring, he's a spy. He's the one telling all your information. So the British stomp over and they go, Hercules, is this true? And Hercules Mulligan says, no, how could I possibly have told them I was here with you the whole time? And they say, that's true. Also, I don't trust Benedict Arnold very much. He does treason sometimes. So they left. So I guess the question is, how did he do this? Well, a gentleman named Cato. See, Hercules Mulligan was one of the wealthy families in New York, and they had one servant. Now, what they called a servant at the time, we today would call an enslaved person. And it is kind of crappy to send your servant, a.k.a. enslaved person, out to do your job for you. But this is what Hercules Mulligan did. Now, to be fair, uh, it does seem like Cato was treated a lot better than most... Uh, uh, slaves could have been treated, uh, New York, uh, mostly in the, in the North, the slaves were treated a little bit better than the plantations we think about in the South. Uh, additionally, uh, Mulligan would later join and someone left. As soon as I mentioned slavery, someone always leaves. Uh, <laughs> Mulligan would later, uh, join the, uh, New York Manumission Society with John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, uh, a bunch of Schuylers, a whole bunch of important people in New York. A bunch of New York founders get together and say, we've had enough of this. And they end up by 1799 uh, gradually abolishing slavery. So we do want to give Mulligan that thumbs up. Uh, but what he would do is he would give the messages to Cato, his servant, who would then go make his way through British lines because the British didn't ask a slave if they were uh, uh, a spy. Why would they? Uh, and Cato would deliver these messages and essentially run cover for Mulligan. So Cato himself should also be given a whole ton of credit for being able to, uh, for saving George Washington's life on several occasions. Now, the American Revolution ends, and Hercules Mulligan is, everyone thinks he's a loyalist, which is not great after the war ends, once, New York, once the Continental Army comes back in and takes over control of New York City. So George Washington, his second day in New York City, has dinner with Hercules Mulligan. And this is twofold reasons for this. First of all, Thanks for saving my life, bud. Am I right? Uh, and secondly, it was a demonstration to all of New York City 
no, Hercules Mulligan is okay. He was with us the whole time. We don't want anyone taking out any vengeance or vendetta against him. He was pretending. He's got the G-dub seal of approval. Uh, and from there, Mulligan pretty much goes back to private life. Like I said, he does uh, participate in the New York Manumission Society, but that was a private organization that was lobbying the government. Um, he doesn't really do it, have any public office or anything of that nature. He did, does have several kids uh, and seems to live a happy life. And that is the actual story of Hercules Mulligan, uh, as opposed to... And again, in the play, they don't get a lot wrong. Um, they leave him out of the second act. Uh, I guess, yeah, he doesn't just run in and start screaming about being a spy at any point. Um, so whatever. He's also not the same age as everyone else. It's the one thing they really kind of get wrong with their casting in Hamilton. Uh, again, I have no problem with the fact that they're not all just white dudes. Uh, but I'm not super pumped that, and, and the guy who plays Mulligan, I will note, does a fantastic job, has some of the best lines in the play, but he should be significantly older than Lafayette and Lawrence and Hamilton, like 20 years older than those guys. Um, the British did not, no, so... You would think the British would have said, well, what about your slave, <laughs> right? Um, no, you, uh, yeah, they kept going to him. They kept letting him tailor. Part, a large part of it was Arnold. A, lot, a large part of it was Mulligan saying, Benedict Arnold, the treason guy, that's the guy. <laughs> and they're like, okay, you're right. <laughs> Arnold's definitely lying. Um, also... Yeah, like, how do you, at the time, how do you call someone out for being a spy if you don't actually catch them in the act? Um, and, 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 and I should remind you that at the time, the British were really trying to win Patriots' hearts. The British didn't want to just win the war and suppress everyone. The British want, wanted to win the war and have everyone be like, yeah, we're British still, we did it. You know, so just kind of blindly executing people for treason uh, is not... The best way to go about that especially in new york city which was heavily loyalist and it was easy to see people become loyalist i i will also remind you that there were mulligan wasn't the only guy at the beginning of the revolution that was very anti what parliament was doing who ends up being a loyalist i mean you have isaac lowe who was the chairman of the committee of 51 once they they dissolve the revolutionary government in new york city uh uh, uh isaac lowe takes over as de facto governor when all, all when, because what happened in most colonies is the royal governor would say, hey, guess what? All you representatives in the assembly, you don't get to meet anymore. So the assembly would go to a different building and meet, and say, what are we going to do about this? And Isaac Lowe was chairman of that meeting in New York City and then went to the First Continental Congress. And then when independence was approaching, got cold feet essentially, and said, uh, no, I'm going to stay a loyalist. So he got to stay around because he realized the error of his ways, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, it is strange. There's a lot of there's a lot of strange things about Hercules Mulligan. The British just kind of let it go. It's, it is very surprising to me personally, uh, and I can understand your surprise, Ashley, that they didn't interrogate this guy a little bit more. But the, what, the other thing about Hercules Mulligan is he was a very fun character to be around. I'm sorry I'm waving a pen at you. I, I, don't, I started this habit earlier in the week. I can't pick that up. He was a lot of fun to be around. He was very charming and well-spoken. That's why people like going to him for the tailor shop, because it was fun. It was a day at the tailor. You know, they didn't have TV back then. They go to the tailor, and he's like, oh, you get this? I'll tell you, tells a joke. Oh, we're doing what? You gain some weight here? You know, like, that kind of thing. So no one wanted to be mad at him, which helps a lot in these situations. Uh, he was, in a way, the perfect candidate for this. Now, I left out, uh, if you watch the TV show Turn, they do have Hercules Mulligan is in that. Uh, and he does associate with them in the show. Now, I have heard him, my hair's bothering me, I have heard him associated with the Culpa Ring, but uh, I don't know of him actually being in it. I think they were aware of him. I don't know how aware of them he was. Believe it or not, uh, because Talmadge was given uh, Woodhull all the information. So Washington would have, 
he Washington kept separate rings for sure, but he definitely at the time Talmadge was in charge of New York City. So Washington and Talmadge would have known about uh, uh, Hercules Mulligan operating also in New York City, as several other people were operating in New York City too. Um, but Woodhull probably would not have contacted him. Uh, I, I will look into it a little more. I, I, I read, it's been a while since I read through the book. I should look back into it a little more. But I don't believe that he actually had contact with the ring. Great question, though. So that, that's Hercules Mulligan. Hercules Mulligan. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. What's next? Sherisha Bourne. All right, this is kind of a shorter one. We'll go through it pretty quick. Uh, Sh- Sheer Jashub Bourne has the best first name in the history of names. And that's pretty much all I need to tell you about. <laughs> so he owned a bunch of ships. He was a merchant. Uh, the Revolutionary War breaks out. There's a boycott going on. You're not supposed to trade with anyone. But Shereshub has all this oil on his boat. And he needs to sell it to Britain. He has investors who have paid him. And he's like, I need to sell it to Britain because that's where it's supposed to go. And then I, the, us patriots can use that money to fight Britain. So he sets the ship off to go sell it to Britain. And is almost immediately captured off the port, off the coast of New Hampshire. Now, he's captured by privateers, and privateers are allowed, they're basically pirates, but they have a government that says, you can do it. It's cool. Just give us part of your spoils. So those privateers took all his stuff, and he sues them in court. He wants his stuff back. Now, he hires the best lawyer he can find. He hires one of the best lawyers of the United States, a guy who's on reprieve from the Second Continental Congress, a guy named John Adams. John Adams comes and helps Shira 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 He helps Shira Jashub. <laughs> I got it. He helps Shira Jashub fight this case. Now, this ends up being a losing case for John Adams, but... Sheer Jashub would put this into courts for decades and decades. 18 years, it would go through appeals until it's finally resolved. And we will talk about that. But unfortunately for John Adams, he loses his last case of all time. See, this is just in the 1770s. But while he's arguing this case, John Langdon comes by and pops in and leans over the bench. And says, hey, hey, John, you got chosen to replace Silas Dean. You're going to France to represent the United States. John Adam goes, all right, <laughs> nice joke, bud. And then uh, Langdon leaves. And Adams really thought it was a joke because why would they choose me? I don't even speak French. Also, at the time, John Adams was one of the people leading the Continental Congress. Uh, he ended up, he wasn't necessarily a leader when they went to the first Continental Congress. By, by the time independence is declared, he is one of the leaders of the Second Continental Congress. Why would they send me away? And also, why did they choose me while I wasn't there? What's going on here? <laughs> and uh, he goes home and gets a letter when he gets home. And Adam, the letter says, John Adams, get your get on a boat, go to France. Uh, and he says, okay. And unbeknownst to anyone, this is the first, last court case John Adams would ever try because he goes to France for almost a decade. Not just France, Europe, N- Netherlands, Great Britain, almost a decade, comes home and he's already vice president, then he becomes president, then he's old and he retires. <coughs> Excuse me. So, that's that. Now, as for Sheer Jashub, as I said, this court case goes on for a long time, and he ends up, despite having tried to trade with Great Britain and breaking the boycott, Sheer Jashub ends up being elected to several parts of the Massachusetts legislature for the next decade, and he is legitimately an American founder. In fact, when the court case is finally resolved in the Supreme Court of the United States, the argument at that point has become, did, who has a right to this first trial? That first trial that John Adams argued, should it be done in Massachusetts? But it was caught off the, in the waters of New Hampshire. Uh, It was also caught by people hired by the Continental Congress. Uh, But should it be considered maritime law? Or what's going on here and by the time it's resolved they said no that should not have even been handled in this particular court setting 
So it's thrown out on a technicality after 18 years. Shiro Jishub doesn't get that stuff back. It's long gone at this point. It was probably easy for him to get it thrown out too, because by this point, Shiro Jishub Boren was a member of the United States House of Representatives. Yes, he had worked his way up all these years through the Massachusetts Assembly and was sent out to the United States House of Representatives. So that's the best name in the whole world. And that is his story. We are going to run probably a little long, so I'm going to move along to someone else who is fascinating. Henry Brockholz Livingston. Or HBL, as I just called him for the first time. So HBL is part of the Livingston family. And there are so many Livingstons. I have another, actually I realized... I'm a little ahead this week because I'm going tomorrow to the Museum of the American Revolution Conference. So I've actually scheduled a bunch of my videos ahead. Uh, his cousin Robert's coming up on Saturday. So look forward to that. We'll talk about him next week too. <clears throat> He's from the Livingston family. They are a gigantic family. Robert Livingston, who I just mentioned, uh, voted for independence but left before signing. Uh, Henry Brockholz Livingston's father was William Livingston, who also was in was there and voted for independence, though also left before the signing, because he ran right back to New Jersey, his dad, where he became governor of New Jersey. And he would be governor of New Jersey. His dad, William Livingston, would be governor of New Jersey for 20 years. The whole revolution. One governor. William Livingston. This is his boy. So Henry Brockholz Livingston, uh, just as the Revolutionary War breaks out, graduates from Princeton. He's a classmate of one James Madison. Yeah, they're classmates and buddies. It's nice. They'll be working together in the future. As of now, Henry Brockholz Livingston goes to war, and he becomes an aide-de-camp to Major General Philip Schuyler. Yeah, if you watch the play Hamilton, as I continuously reference, you might know the name Philip Schuyler. He's the father of the Schuyler sisters, father-in-law, future father-in-law of Alexander Hamilton, and, well, the second ranking, a third ranking major general in the Continental Army in charge of all of New York and Canada. So he is working directly for a pretty important dude. Fanny Hoosel. He's with him for a while, and then things go wrong. You see, Philip Schuyler ends up being removed from his position and given a court martial and tried for not doing well at his job. Now, this is mostly for Horatio Gates and the aforementioned uh, uh, slippery Jim Wilkinson, uh, talking a lot of trash to the Continental Congress about Schuyler, despite Schuyler really doing a pretty good job uh, handling a desperate situation. But Schuyler gets removed, and the Battle of Saratoga is about to start. Lucky for Henry Brockholst, he is taken under the wing as an aide-de-camp to Benedict Arnold. Now, I know that name nowadays rings some crappy bells, but at the time, Benedict Arnold was a war hero. There, I have a video with Michael Troy coming out next Monday, uh, next Wednesday, where we just, we just, just Benedict Arnold for two hours. It's amazing. <laughs> now, unfortunately, uh, Arnold goes on to be the hero of Saratoga, as we mentioned, but Horatio Gates, who was now in charge of the Northeast, took over from Philip Schuyler, doesn't love that Benedict Arnold, his subordinate, took the team, essentially, from the guy he replaced. And that's really the biggest divide that splits Arnold and Gates about this time, is Henry Brockholz Livingston. So he goes, he fights, he is successful, he's a very important part of the uh, battle of Saratoga, the victory at Saratoga. And then he resigns. Because he wants to study more, I want to get my law degree. And he does that for a few months before his brother-in-law, John Jay recruits him. Yes, it's all in the family. His sister is Sarah Livingston, uh, she ma who married John Jay. She becomes Sarah Livingston Jay. John Jay, an extraordinarily important person in his own right. And John Jay and his sister Sarah are going to Spain. John Jay was appointed minister to Spain. So Henry Brockholst joins his brother-in-law and sister as secretary and goes on a diplomatic mission overseas spent several years in Spain. Now, this is not very successful. It's just more trouble than it's worth. But uh, they do it, and then they leave. Uh, well, Henry leaves first, because John Jay goes over to France to sign the Treaty of Paris and end the war himself. Well, with Franklin and Adams and 
actually, uh, 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 Lawrence's dad, uh, Henry Lawrence, was there too, though unofficially. Um, Henry Brockholz bounces back to the United States, and right as he's about to get to the port of New York, his ship gets captured by the British. And he is brought into custody. Now, fortunately for him, uh, this is in 1782, and it's almost a year after Yorktown. So the war is essentially over. No big deal. They release him on parole after three weeks. No one really cares. Except for him. He's probably super pumped about it. <laughs> he goes um, <clears throat> goes back home, becomes a lawyer, or goes to New York and becomes a lawyer in New York. And in fact, uh, if you watch that play, Hamilton, at one point they mention uh, the first court case of our new nation. Uh, they talk about Hamilton and Burr. Hamilton, sit down. Uh, it's Hamilton and Burr uh, in that case, in the play. In real life, it's Hamilton and Burr and a third guy. Henry Brockholz Livingston is on that team. And it's not the first court case. I guarantee you there were murders before the year 1800. Also, I should note that that song is at the end of the first act, which is in like the early 1780s. And the second act starts in the late, 17, in, in the late 1780s. Um, that court case actually happened in 1800. So right before uh, Burr ties with Jefferson running for president. So they call it close. Um, and so, through this, through many other cases, Henry Brockholz Livingston really makes a name for himself as a, um, a lawyer. Uh, he eventually is appointed as a justice on the Supreme Court of New York State, where he continues to make very important decisions, especially one regarding property law called P Pearson v. Post. Um, and then he is appointed by President Thomas Jefferson in 1806 to the United States Supreme Court. And he'd still be there when Jimmy Madison became president, too. I told you they'd work together again. Uh, now, interestingly enough, the Democratic Republicans appointed him to counterbalance John Marshall and Bushrod Washington, who were Federalists and were going to be on the court for a long time. But much to their dismay, Henry Brockholz Livingston actually ends up siding with those Federalists for the next 12 years uh, until he passes away on the court. So that is Henry Brockholz Livingston. Again, another fascinating guy. And we're going to do one more story. Uh, we've already run over our time. Uh, we're about to run over our time, but we're going to do Betsy Patterson. Uh, Betsy Patterson was a young, beautiful woman living in 1806. Uh, just as Livingston was getting appointed to the Supreme Court, she was living in Maryland, and a charming young man showed up. And that young man's name was Jerome Bonaparte. And if Bonaparte sounds familiar... This is the little brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, who had just crowned himself Emperor of France. Uh, Jerome is looking for a beautiful wife. He wants to marry a wealthy American and go back and tell his brother, hey, I'm, I did this. Uh, unfortunately, he marries Betsy Patterson. They marry almost right away and get pregnant very quickly. Uh, Napoleon doesn't like this. He doesn't like that name. Who, who's Patterson? It's not even William Patterson, who's also on the Supreme Court. That has one T. Will you tell me you didn't marry a Jefferson daughter? Or a Schuyler sister, or a Livingston. Imagine a Livingston. Uh, no, you married some random girl. Now she wasn't just a random girl. She came from a very wealthy family, and we are going to uh, elaborate on that a little bit. But Jerome says Napoleon says, "Don't even bring her here. Leave her in America." Uh, Jerome says no, and sails back with Betsy uh, to introduce his new wife to his brother and family. And Napoleon. Per prevents, uh, does not permit Betsy to get off the boat. Uh, so Jerome says, okay, I'll tell you what, he's in Italy right now. Napoleon actually tried to get the Pope to annul this marriage, uh, which Popes don't usually do. And, and this is one of the few times the Pope says no, t no to Napoleon. Uh, but Napoleon always gets his way and he decrees and makes a law because he's emperor, he can do whatever he wants, makes a law that they're divorced now. Um, Jerome gets off the boat to go talk some sense to his older brother. And that's the last time they saw each other. Betsy can't get off the boat. She ends up going to Britain to have a baby. If the baby was born in France, it would have been French, which was important because now he's royalty. Instead, they, she has to go to Britain. He's born in Britain uh, and therefore is an American. Not everyone's favorite situation. Uh, Betsy ends up going back to America. She spends 10 years trying to get a divorce because she's not seeing her husband again. Um, <clears throat> uh, and she has the son, Jerome Napoleon Bonaparte, is an American boy growing up in Maryland. Uh, and this lineage gets even better. 
uh, in a minute. But has his baby. Uh, he grows up. They end up. Uh, she ends up taking over her father's business, which is like a, a very expensive. It's like a valued at like a million and a half dollars, which is a lot of money back then. And she's one of the few women in the early republic running a business of this stature. Uh, she does end up going back to Europe eventually, after Napoleon is removed. Uh, she joins the wealthy elite there and rubs elbows with all the right people. And at one point, she's at a party in Paris, where she actually sees. Her old husband Jerome after 15 years they make eye contact very briefly and then turn away and then never see each other again now by this point Jerome had already been appointed King of Westphalia which means Betsy would have been a queen if Napoleon had let her come ashore uh, Westphalia is a state in Germany at the time Germany wasn't one Germany it was a bunch of different kingdoms so her ex-husband became a king uh, unfortunately now she ends up going back. She lives 94 years old. She ends up living like, uh, uh, was it 94? I don't know. She ends up like, yeah, 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 94. And then she's like well past the civil war. So she sees a lot happen. Her son, Jerome Napoleon Bonaparte, ends up going over to Europe and ends up being accepted by the royalty at one point. He becomes minor nobility. And then his son, Charles, Betsy's grandson, Charles Bonaparte ends up making his way up and becoming first attorney general, or uh, first uh, secretary of the Navy, and then attorney general of the United States under the Theodore Roosevelt administration. Let that sink in. Napoleon Bonaparte's grand nephew was in the Theodore Roosevelt administration. And it's all thanks to Betsy Patterson over here. And that is a little bit of a sad story. It makes it always makes me sad when I when I hear that story because, you know, when their eyes meet at that one party in France, you gotta feel like it was heartbreaking enough. It probably would have been better if they never saw each other again. You would imagine, because you see them. Oh man, we should still be together. Ah, oh, lame. Because it does sound like they loved each other as young people. So, story of Betsy Patterson. Those are the founders from the week. Somehow we're only three minutes over. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, hit like. Uh, if you're new here, subscribe. You know the drill. Uh, and I am sweaty and tired. I have a lot more work to finish up tonight, so I don't have nothing to do this weekend. While I go to the Mohawk Valley American Revolution Conference, I am so excited for it. Uh, I am going to leave you now. I am probably going to shoot... Oh, why? Okay, so Jerome didn't go to Britain because... Um, they went to Italy, and he got off to go talk to Napoleon... And Napoleon said, no, you can't go back on that boat. And Napoleon gets his way. He's Napoleon. He named himself emperor. Uh, and the authorities just didn't let him get on. And they sent the boat away. Unfortunately, it's just that simple. You know, Jerome is not the only Napoleon brother to come to America and have a baby. Uh, the other one, Joseph Napoleon, who I think was the oldest, he had been king of Spain. But after... Because Napoleon named his brothers kings of Europe. Like, they ran Europe for about 10 years there. And then Napoleon gets beaten in Waterloo, and he gets sent out to exile, which was in the Caribbean. Napoleon dies in the Caribbean. That's where he's exiled the second time. Uh, his uh, older brother went to New Jersey and didn't marry, but he took on a mistress by the name of Savage. I think it was Annette Savage, I believe was her name. Uh, and they have a bunch of kids, and they moved to, like, upstate New York, and there's, like, a Napoleonic, there's, like, Lake Napoleon or something <laughs> named after that family from, like, way upstate New York, like, just south of Canada. Uh, at the, about, uh, this is, this is later. This is about probably 15 years after uh, Jerome and Betsy first go over there. Part of me is a little surprised that those two families don't become closer. But, yeah. Uh, unfortunately... Jerome was told, you don't get to go back to your wife. You have to go be king of Germany or Westphalia. You have to go be a king. And Jerome was like, Ugh, okay. <laughs> Poor Jerome. Uh, though I do feel bad for him. I do, like, in a very, very real sense, feel bad for him. Because he shouldn't have married Betsy in the first place. It seems like they fell in love. She was, should not have been... 
like you're a brother of Napoleon. Even though we don't have nobility in America, everyone, president, at the time, the president was Thomas Jefferson, who would have seen the value in having someone marry a Napoleon brother. Uh, you know, even though we, they no longer had those old-timey European nobility intermarrying, where everyone's the same family, they're just running different places. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that. They did still have that. They would have that through World War I. <laughs> uh, the King of England and, and, and Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany at, during World War I were cousins. Ugh. The world. Um, it's a great question. If you guys have any more questions, you can always feel free to contact me anywhere you like. I've been really trying to be more active on Discord. Um, I am going to try and shoot some live videos from the road this week. I'm not sure what they'll be about. Uh, maybe if I run into the right person, I'll be like, hey, let's do a quick live video. We'll see. I'm going in unprepared, as per usual. But thank you guys for watching. I uh, love making these videos with you. Uh, I will be back. Uh, oh, no trivia tomorrow, because I'll be on the road, uh, and I don't know what time I'll get back to the hotel or anything like that, so lame. Uh, I will have fun. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, I will be back on Sunday. I might pop out a live video on Sunday just to recap or do something fun. I will be back to our normal schedule next week, so thank you so much for watching, and I will leave you with Round Bottom. I hit the right button.